Okay, so how is everyone today? Good? So, shh, 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 shh. How is everyone? Good. As good as I'm going to get. <clears throat> so, last time. What's today? All day, right? Every once in a while it does this. There it goes. You have to give it something sharp to focus on. Okay, so last time uh, we had talked about uh, <coughs> the definition of a K form. Okay, and we hadn't really got a chance to have an example, and the, one of the unfortunate things about the definition, that definition is that it's so abstract that it can't can't really be made sense of until you do a few working examples. So let's, let's, let's do a few uh, working examples. <clears throat> so for example, example number one. So we'll write dx1 wedge dx2. So because we have, because we have two things wedged together, that, that thing in the middle is referred to as a wedge, then what kind of thing is this? It's a two-form. It's a two-form. But because I have, I've been nonspecific, we don't know if this is a two-form on R2, or a two-form on R3, or a two-form on R2451. <coughs> so, a two-form, <coughs> how, many, how many vectors do I have to supply in order to, in order to evaluate a two-form? Two. Two vectors must be supplied. Now, they might be really tall vectors, that is to say vectors in a high dimensional space, that might be like in R10. Two vectors in R10. Okay, but I'm going to give two vectors in uh, R4. So, the first one, one, two, negative one, one. And the second vector, three, negative 2, uh, 1, 2. Okay. So the rule that we, that we wrote down last time was <coughs> that each one of these individual items uh, does a specific action. What will, what will this one do? Well, each one of them takes a row each one of them takes a row, and because this is dx1, it will take the first row. It'll take the first row. And because the next one is dx2, it will take the second row. So now, if we take two rows and we put them all together in a matrix, <coughs> then what two by two matrix will we have? What will the first row be? One, three. And the second row? Two, negative two. And the evaluation rule is that you take the rows as specified and then compute determinant. Okay, so now this thing right here is something you could have done some time ago, right? So then what's, what is the determinant? What, what is it? <laughs> negative 8, right? So 1 times negative 2 and then minus 3 times 2. Negative 8. Okay, interesting. <clears throat> how about, how about uh, if I ask, what is dx1 uh, wedge dx three on the same vectors.
So now what, do, what does the evaluation rule say? Take the first row, then take the third row, and then put it all together in a square matrix and compute determinant. <clears throat> so this one is saying, take the first row. This one is saying, take the third row. So that would be determinant 1, 3, negative 1, 1, which is what? 4. Okay, interesting. So now I have a question. Let's take, again, those same vectors. But now I'm going to do dx1, uh, dx3 wedge dx1 on the same vectors. Now, you can, sh I suspect you're getting comfortable enough with this rule that you could, you could faithfully carry it out and compute, but I claim that you should be able to tell me the answer right now. Negative four. It must surely be negative four. Why? Right. What is, what is the action of, of commuting these two? So what's going to happen as a result in our computation rule is the two rows will be, will be commuted. So you'll swap, swapping these two causes these two rows to be swapped. And then, and then from your linear algebra experience, swapping two rows in a, in a, in a matrix negates the determinant. Okay. Uh, whoops, I was just copying the one immediately above it. So, negative one, 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 three. Yes, it's negative four. So in this case, the rule was uh, that we'd take the third one first. <clears throat> and then we'd take the first one second. Okay, good. What if, what if we do say um, dx2 wedge dx2 on the same vectors again, but I still claim, I still claim that I, I'm, I'm going to write the same vectors. But I claim that you can, you can tell me the answer right now. It's going to have to be zero. Yeah? Um, I was going, I was just curious what the actual operator is. So do we call it two form as the operator? Or? Th this, oops. this thing hmm, by itself when you're not supplying it an argument. This is referred to as a two form. Okay. So all of these are two forms. So you can think of these as, as functions that require two vectors uh, to be evaluated. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so then, so then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to faithfully copy this down. Again, the same vectors, 1, 2, negative 1, 1. 3, negative 2, 1, 2. But even before I consider it, yes, this should be 0. Why, why should it be 0? Sorry? I agree. What's an, yes? Oh, I mean, um, think about it like a matrix, you know, the rows Right, so you can think of it this way also. So there's repeated rows. <laughs> and, and for that matter, uh, let's, let's write it down to make sure that everyone can see it. So if we repeat the second row twice, then it would be 2, negative 2, and 2, negative 2. So it's repeated. Interesting. So this is 0. 
Okay, so any question about uh, these so far? <coughs> so there was, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> there was uh, another concern expressed last time, and that is that uh, when you consider, when you're not considering these to be separate, uh, separate vectors, but you're considering this to just be a matrix with two columns, then this is a tall matrix in the sense that there's more rows than columns. So it's tall like a building, like a skyscraper. Okay, but then there was a concern, what if we have a, what if we have, uh, a wide matrix? What if, it's, what if it's really wide? That is to say that it has less rows than columns. Can we still do, uh, can we still do this kind of thing? Okay. So what about, uh, let's think here for a moment. I'm going to write dx, and I'm going to leave the subscript blank for a minute. So dx wedge dx wedge dx. And I'm going to leave, I'm leaving these slots open for just a moment, because I want you to think about it. dx wedge dx wedge dx. And suppose that, uh, so, so what kind of form is this? It's a three form. It's a three form because there's three of them. Okay, and how many vectors do I need to uh, supply? Three, three vectors. Okay, I have to supply three vectors because you can think of a k form as something that eats k vectors at a time. You can think of it in this way. Okay, <coughs> so what if we give it this? So it's got to, I've got to fill in these three vectors, right, in order for what we're writing to be sensible. I've got to give it three vectors. So now suppose I give it this, one, two, five, seven, and three, one. <clears throat> so now... I want you to think about it for a moment, and, but don't blurt it out loud. I claim that you can tell me the answer, what it must be right now, with no computation. <laughs> zero is a good guess, right? So if I'm, with all that, I'm saying you can do it without any comp, it's got to be zero, right? Okay. But why must it be zero? Right, let's think about it. Let's think about it. Uh, how many rows are there to select from? There's two rows. Right? There's just two of them. So what I mean, so th this is an example of what I mean by a, sh uh, uh, a short uh, matrix or a, w or a wide matrix. Okay, less rows than columns. So there's only two rows, but we have to select, we have to make three selections. So necessarily we must select at least one row at least twice. What, what's the name of that, by the way? Which one? The pigeonhole principle, right? For those of you who've taken whatever that course is from. What is it, discrete math? Yeah. So let's see if we can get away with it. So maybe I'll select the first row in the first one. And then I'll select the second row in the last one. And then, uh, well, which one are we going to do for the middle one? One, that's the first one I heard. So we're going to select uh, the first row twice. We're going to select the first row twice. So as a result, this would be the determinant of, and I'm going to write it out once, so, so we never have to do it again. So what's going to be the shape of this matrix, the rows and columns? Three by three. So it's going to be uh, one, five, three. And then one five three again, and then two seven one. Okay, so what's the determinant without any computation? Zero, because it because this determinant has a repeated row. Okay, so what that means? What that means is that this is a three form on R what? On R two. It's a three form because it takes three vectors on R2 because the vectors are sitting inside of R2. So, so this is a K form on Rn. So what kind of form is it? A, a two form on R4. 
because it takes two vectors that are in sitting inside of R4. So what is the evaluation of, say, uh, a 51 form on R24? Zero. It's zero. Why is the evaluation of a 51 form on R24 equal to zero every time? It's, it's the exact same kind of reason here, is that we, we have to make 51 row selections, but there's only 24 choices. So we're necessarily going to have to pick at least one row at least twice. Pro probably with the pigeonhole principle, you could say more than twice, even. Okay, so really zero. Okay. <clears throat> Any question about uh, this rule for evaluating uh, forms? Okay. <clears throat> Good. So now I hope you have, whenever I see a page like that that's just full of rules like this row, that column, then determinant, it always makes me kind of wretch just a little bit because I'm, really I'm not really a sentences person, I'm a pictures person. So let's, uh, let's see, what, what do these forms do? What, what are they doing from a, from a picture point of view? Okay. <clears throat> so let's consider. Uh, how about this is the plane, and here uh, we have a vector, and I'm construing it to be an increment. That is to say that it's not located at any point in particular. Um, <coughs> Suppose that, uh, suppose that uh, we're going to have a form which takes just this one vector, then I want you to tell me what k and what n it would be f to say that it's a k form on Rn. So what k? One form. It's a one form, because, it t because why is it a one form? It takes one vector, and it's a, so it's a one form on R what? R2. Two, because we're sitting inside of R2. Okay, so, so we're drawing a picture of what of what a one form on R2 would do. <clears throat> okay, so then now, uh, a one form, that means how many things are going to be wedged together? Just one of them, right? So there's going to be no wedges. It'll just be dx, either one or two, since we're going to name all the, all the axes, this one x1 and that one x2. So let's see, if we call this, uh, if we call this V, to give it a name, <clears throat> then what does dx1 evaluated at V do? It gives you the first, the first row of V and, produce, and makes a square matrix <laughs> What's the shape of that square matrix? One by one. one by one, right? So if we say that V, if we say that V has coordinates, V1, V2, then dx1 applied to V, dx1 applied to V would be the determinant of the one by one matrix V1. And what is the determinant of the one by one matrix V1? V1. So that is to say, if you had a, if you had the mate the square matrix, scalar matrix that had a that had a seven in it, its determinant is seven. So the way to uh, understand that visually is the following. Suppose that we had a light way up high at infinity, and it's shining toward the x1 axis, this would cast a shadow. It would cast a shadow, and in particular, it would cast an oriented shadow, a pointy shadow. So it would cast this shadow. <clears throat> okay. 
Okay. So just from the just from the picture now, please tell me what is this green one is sitting on this axis. I had to draw it above, otherwise you couldn't see it. But it, understand it's sitting in there. What's its length? It's v1. This has length v1. So this is this. Okay, but if it worked for the first axis, surely it works for the second one, right? So, uh, now, from the way I drew the picture, you should be able to tell me the sign, the S-I-G-N of V1. The, si the sign of V1 is positive. Because, because, this is V, this, this thing has length, sorry? Okay. <laughs> uh, so, so the question is, is V1 pointing in the same sense as the axis it was projected to? Or opposite sense? Same sense. So V1 is positive. Okay, Al alternatively, you could ask, when you draw from tail to head, are you moving to the right? You are. Okay, so let's project to uh, the other axis. And we'll again project a pointy shadow. Okay, so this is the, that's the shadow you would see. And where's the pointy bit? This way, right? Okay, then from the, from the picture, from the picture, you should be able to tell me what is the SIGN of V2? It's negative. You can tell that it's negative because when you draw from tail to head, you're going downward. From the picture, you can also tell it's negative because the projection of V onto, the, onto this axis, notice that it is pointing in the opposite sense. Okay, this one is pointing up, that one is pointing down. Very good. So this is the, this is, this is the action of a one form on R2. It projects, it, on, it projects that vector onto the axis and then measures its signed length. Okay, did you have a question? Okay. <clears throat> so now, uh, how about now I'm drawing uh, three space. <clears throat> okay. So now I'm going to draw a uh, a parallelogram. I need two different vectors and it's going to be, it's not a located parallelogram, it's just going to be floating out in space. Uh, I'm going to draw it in this way. So I'll say that uh, this one is V okay, and then uh, the next one is a W. And then I'll complete the parallelogram in the usual way. So, so this is two. This is uh, a parallelogram that's floating around in space, in the same sense that this is a parallelogram floating around in space. <coughs> Okay, so what kind of form could eat this parallelogram? A two-form. A two-form could eat it. Why, 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 is, uh, why is a two-form the kind of thing that eats this parallelogram? It's two vectors, right? It's two vectors. And in particular, what, what, are, in, what are in are these vectors sitting inside of? So what kind of k-form on Rn am I about to demonstrate? A two form on R3. A two form on R3. Okay. Uh, could someone give us an example of a two form? Okay. 
dx2 wedge dx3 would be one of them. Okay, so one of them is, uh, say, that, that one you just said, dx2 wedge dx3. What's another one? dx1 wedge dx2. Okay, what's another one? Okay, very good. Okay, so now, what's another one? One and one. But I'll, I'll claim in a sense that that one's a bit trivial, isn't it? dx1 wedge dx1. Why is that one going to be trivial? Because you can see from the evaluation rule if you, uh, on the previous page, this will surely be zero. So whatever, whatever it's doing geometrically, I can show you right here. <laughs> this is what dx1 wedge dx1 would do, whatever that is. Okay, <clears throat> okay let's consider the specific case. Uh, let's consider this one, since that one will be the easiest to draw. So which, which axis is which in the usual reckoning? So which axis is the first one? In, in the usual reckoning, the one coming out of the page. And then where's the second one? To the right. And then by process of elimination, that's the last one. OK, so, so. Uh, Let's consider what dx1 wedge dx2 would do. So by analogy to doing it this way, dx1 applied to v projected, it, projected v onto the x1 axis. Okay, so then dx1 wedge dx2 is going to project this onto the x1, x2 plane. It's going to project it down here. Okay, so let's take this corner and I'll say that that corner ends up right there. <clears throat> then maybe V, because you know the perspective is weird, maybe V ends up looking like this. Gets projected something like that. Okay, and then W ends up getting projected something like this. <clears throat> so then I can complete the parallelogram, and this has its sense. So now, rem remember, the way, that this is, the way that this is done is that, algebraically anyway, you're, you're taking away one of the rows, or if you like, just selecting two of the rows. So this red vector, not, not V up here, up here, but this red vector, what, what uh, kind of space is it sitting inside? It's sitting inside of R2, a copy of this copy of R2, the one down here. And similarly, the green vector is sitting down here. So when you do this projection, when you do this projection, you keep the orientation uh, that, that is here. So it projects down to here. So what will dx1, which dx2, applied to uh, applied to v and w do so what's it going to do not just the area the signed area so this is the signed area That's interesting. So then, uh, please tell me, what would uh, what would dx1 dx3 uh, wedge dx3 do? It would project it onto this side, right? And you, the, the the flashlight would be over here, the shadow would be right there, and you'd see this thing projected onto the other wall, if you like. And then you could you could get out your ruler and measure it, and and you could say, oh, the the, the signed area of this object floating in three space being projected onto this two space. Interesting. Yes? Does the orientation's arrow obey the whole conception of it being a shadow? Yes. Okay. Yes. 
Yes? Because we need to have orientation, this only works if k equals n minus 1, right? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forestall that, answering that kind of question. So the point, the point of me doing this is that my experience in this course is, is the way you usually teach this course, the way textbooks are designed, you wait until like you're 80% done with the course, then you start talking about this. But you'll notice that we skipped to chapter 6. This is in chapter 6. But by the time you get to that point in time in the course, everyone is emotionally exhausted, right? Okay, and then this, this, these are the fundamental little actors that we have to deal with at the end. So I'm introducing them now so that that can be stewing in your brain. So my, the ans in answer to your question, I'm going to put off answering it until the time where it, until the time is right. Yes? So what is like the x3 wedge dx1? Right. So <clears throat> uh, that one's more difficult to draw <laughs> because 3-1 uh, would is the same as 1, 3, except you're, you, you do the first one, then you switch the axes. So that'll cause it to uh, change its orientation. Okay, so then that is to say, uh, if we were to, here, this is dx1, dx2. You can understand dx2, dx1 by first doing this and then performing a reflection. Okay, good. Okay, so in summary, we have that uh, these forms, uh, yes? What if the projection is line? What if the projection is a line? Is a li you mean if you do a one form on R3? No, the, the two form in R3, what if it is trying to project it towards the, yeah. the X3, right. you get a line, for instance. Okay, Let, let's imagine. Let's imagine this for a moment. So we can, actually, we can actually do it. I think I understand what you're saying. So this page, you can ignore my, my hands there, the rest of me. So I'm trying to hold it orthogonal to the light. So the shadow that's behind it, can you see the shadow? Not really, because I'm holding it in front of It's kind of working as well as I have hoped. Maybe if I can look here. So, so you can see it like that. Now, if I turn it askew, the shadow gets smaller, doesn't it? If I put it right on edge, if it was just perfect, it'd be zero. So that's the answer to your question. Yeah. So mathematically, like you said, when you take the a determinant, it's the area of the position, right? So what will happen mathematically when you get the line? When the geometry is line? Will it be like a zero or length of the line? No, a two, a two form on R3. Okay, on R3, we got the area of the projection. Yes, the what sine area. Sine area. So in geometry, if it is coming as a line. You mean a one form on R3? No, the one that we just showed. So is, I'm guessing if the, if the, the, the shape is perfect, parallel with the plane of two of the dimensions, mm -hmm. then the projection onto the third one here would be yeah. that flat line. So then what would the area of the zero be? Zero. It would be zero. Yeah, so that is to say, that is to say I could ask, remember, this is one of the reasons why, I, why we started talking about k volume. What is the, what is the three volume of a point? Zero. What's the three volume of a line? Zero. zero. What's the three volume of a plane? Zero. Still zero. But now finally, if we talk about the unit cube, the unit box, the three volume of the unit box is one. So what, what's happened, it, it's like asking, it's like asking a question like, suppose that we had a platonically perfect line, that is to say, infinitely thin of infinite extent. How much paint would it take to paint it? None, right? Because it has no area. 
It, well, that is to say, its area is zero. How long is a point? Zero, right? It, ha it has no linear extent. So yes, you can, you can project. It, it can so happen that you can project a two-dimensional thing, and it ends up projecting onto a one-dimensional Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so in, in summary, I'd like for you to observe the following. And these are things I want you to... So I want you to think about the, the signed area aspect of these forms. Signed area projections. And I also want you to observe these two properties. That dx1 wedge dx2 is the negation of dx2 wedge dx1. So this can be understood either uh, by making an making a algebra algebraic consideration of determinants. What this does is this this one accepts a two, uh, accepts a two by two matrix. This one accepts a two by two matrix, but this one, this one swaps two rows, so it's negated. Alternatively, this one projects and then computes signed area, and this one does the same projection and then reflects, and computes the same signed area, but the reflection causes the orientation to reverse. Okay, so so commuting causes negation. Commuting causes negation. And dxi wedge dxi is what? Is zero. That is to say, when you take when you take this two form, which has a, which has a repeated uh, element in it, then you're going to get zero. You're going to get zero from the algebraic point of view because that's saying you're selecting the same row twice, so you're going to compute a determinant where one of the rows is repeated, so you're going to get zero. Alternatively, alternatively, that means you're more or less going to select a vector and then select another vector that's exactly the same vector and consider the parallelogram, the trivialized two parallelogram that, that it actually has become flat. How much area does the trivial two parallelogram have? None, right? Because here's what it looks like. First you go this way, then you go this way, then you go this way, then you go this way. Those are the four sides of the parallelogram, and, and these two are on top of each other, and those two are on top of each other. So how much area? No area. Now, you know something. You know something that does just this. You know something that is a product-looking thing. Commutation causes negation, and product with self is zero. You know something that does this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If I could just take this and just open it up like this, take the, take the wedge and open it up so it would have another one on top. Yeah, the cross product does exactly this. Good. So I want you to think about that while we move on to something else. So any questions before we move to the next thing? Okay. So now that now that we've went slight detour through through part of chapter six, now we're going to get back on the main line and uh, be in, back in uh, the beginning of calculus. So this is section 1.5, limits and continuity. Okay, so first definition of an open ball. The set, uh, I'll say let epsilon greater than zero be given. The set B epsilon centered at x, which is defined as the set of all y, such that uh, the distance between x and y is less than epsilon. <coughs> is called the open ball. So this is 
with x in Rn. So we, we already had a definition of open ball, and we alter, alternately called it open ball and open interval when we were talking about the reals. Even if we were to just remove the little hats and the n, then it would be exactly the same if, if, if those x's and y's weren't wearing hats. So, <clears throat> for example, in the plane, you could have some point x, and now I'm going to construe x as being a location and not an increment, so it's a definite position. Then if that's x, then what does the open ball look like? It looks like a, yeah, a, <laughs> if you do it in the standard way, dotted circle. And what does the dottedness mean? What does it signify? Yeah, we're not including that. Okay, and then this, the radius of this is what? Epsilon. So what we're saying is that uh, it's the set of all points that are in here. So there's, there's a permissible y, because that y is within epsilon. Uh, of x. But this point over here, w, that's a point that's in the plane, but it's not in the ball. Okay, any question about that? <clears throat> okay, definition of an open set. A set x subset of Rn is called open. when for all vector x in set x there exists an epsilon greater than zero such that <clears throat> the ball of radius epsilon centered at x at vector x is a subset of set x. Okay, so now this is kind of a stilted definition but this is, it's incredibly important, so we're going to look at it for a minute. <clears throat> okay, so intuitively, I hope to give you an intuition about what this means, <clears throat> we could consider uh, a set like the following. So I'm drawing a subset of the plane, and by, by making, it, by making the, this dashed, I mean I'm not including points which, which fall on the boundary. They're, they're not in there. So what I want you to imagine is that here's a point. There's a red point. Is it possible to surround that red point in a ball without leaving the set that I drew? Is it? Well, I have a question. What, if I drew, what about this ball? This ball leaves the set. Does that mean that this, that this set isn't open? Yeah, it just means that I wasn't very clever when I selected that ball, was I? So, so there's a point. The question is, is that for that point, is it possible to draw any ball? Any ball whatsoever. Can, can you find a ball that's small enough that fits in there? Yeah. All we need is for there to be one. It doesn't have to be true for every epsilon. It has to be true for some epsilon. OK. So if this is set x, then this ball of radius epsilon centered at point x is sitting inside of x. OK. How about, how about uh, something like this. So I'll draw part of it with a solid wall. So by that I mean, I mean all the points that are enclosed in there, but for the dashed, we, I'm not including those, those points, but for the solid one I am including those points. Is this an open set? Why not? I mean, look, here's, here's a red point. Can you put a ball around it? Yes. Yeah. Here, look, I did it. I learned how to do it. 
Does that mean that it's open? Ah, but it has to be for all, right? It has to be for all. It has to be for all points, right? So, can you tell me a point for which cannot be found inside of X, inside a ball? Right. Let's consider this one, this red point. And I want you to imagine drawing an extremely small ball around it, very small. So here's, a, here's as small as it can show up well on the camera. But you can imagine that, I, that it's very small. Can you see? Can you see that you cannot make that ball small enough so that it would fit inside of X? You can't make it small enough. So this set right here is open, this one. And this set right here is not open. So does that mean closed? No, no it does not. <laughs> right? I already made the joke, right? So the, not open does not mean closed. Uh, but, the, but because sets are not doors, right? Doors are either open or closed. Which, which is a long-standing joke. But then, then the joke went really, really high class because there's actually a study of spaces called door spaces in which all sets are either open or closed. <laughs> Sorry? I guess so. I don't. I don't know much about them. Just their existence, so I can make that joke. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Good. So, what's a closed set? Yes. Set C, which is a subset of R n is called closed when Rn minus C is open. Okay. <clears throat> Let's think about that for a minute. Uh, here's a set. And by this set, by this set, I mean uh, this set and all the stuff in it. So all the stuff inside of that square. Is this a closed set? It is a closed set. Now, how do you, how do you, how do you observe that it is, in fact, a closed set? Let's consider its complement. Let's consider its complement. If we, if we draw its complement, its complement looks like... like this. So that is to say everything that's not in the square. Everything that's not in there. Is that open? Yeah, I think we can all agree that if we're far away from the square, then the answer is, then, then that's not an interesting question. Right? So you can always do that. But do you observe that even if you start getting close to the square, it doesn't matter how close you get. Even if you get really, really close. That's as close as I can get with a pen. <laughs> and it still work. You can always draw a ball around it. So the complement of that, of that shape is open. And as a result, that shape is closed. Okay, good. Any question about that? Yes? Um, so, uh, somebody had asked me like, what, if that, that was a named property, like the fact that you could always find another, you just divide by two, or a particular difference divide by two. Like, like you could always find a closer thing. Mm -hmm. um, is, is, that like a, is that named in some way? In, in, yeah, I, I guess so, infinity. Uh, it, it's just a property of the real numbers. A supremum or is it something like that? I don't, I don't know. Um, well, I'll have, so let, ask me after class because what you're saying is a few different, could be construed in a few different ways. But, but uh, yeah, ask me after class. Yes? Uh, you can bring it back just for a second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't understand your notation for how that represents complement, the Rn dash C. That's subtraction. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> take take the whole shebang and then take out 
can see, yeah. So like scissoring this, this thing out. Right. You can also use a slash, right? Yeah, yeah, some people use a diagonal slash. That looks weird to me, I don't know. Use it, I, I'll know what you mean. Okay, close set, good. <clears throat> Uh, so, next, uh, the definition of the natural domain of a function. What time is it? Plenty of time. Natural domain. Uh, this is for a function. Defined by an expression. This is the largest set on which it is defined. Okay. So for example, suppose we go back to way back in the day. How about um, x plus 3 divided by x minus 5? So this is a function. It's defined by an expression, that expression, an algebraic expression. Uh, the natural domain is the largest set of x's for which this expression can be defined. So what is the natural domain of this function? Everything but 5, right? Everything's permissible except 5. So negative infinity to 5, and then union 5 to infinity. By the way, according to the definition of, of open and closed, what is this? This is an, op an open set, right? Okay, because uh, that part is open, because now, remember, we're talking about one-dimensional balls. And the, the name for one-dimensional balls is intervals, right? <laughs> Symmetric intervals. If you select a point that's in that interval, would you be able to put a symmetric open interval around it? Sure, right? The only place where it could be a problem is at 5, but 5's not in there. Similarly, uh, the other side is open too. Okay, good. <clears throat> so, more interesting example. How about f of x and y is equal to the square root of x divided by y. So now we have two arguments. Uh, one, one thing is obvious because of the division. What, what couldn't possibly be part? Y is zero couldn't possibly be part of it, right? Okay, because we, that for that division, uh, division by zero is insupportable. Uh, furthermore, uh, because of the radical, because of the, it's an even radical, what is, what is the requirement for the natural domain of an even radical? Right, well, whatever it is that I'm covering up has to be non-negative. That's the rule, right? So you can plug in, uh, you can plug in zero or anything positive, but negative things are out. Okay, so uh, well, I'm covering up x divided by y, and they're, they're sort of independent of each other. So if x and y were both positive, it would work. So, so, so the top right quadrant. But what else would work? The bottom left quadrant would also work, and so would some of, some of the axes. Right? So let's think about it. The, 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 the top right and bottom left quadrants would work, and what ac what halves of which axes would work? Let's draw it so we can be definite. So I'll, I'll make a picture of the axes here and then draw a picture of the set over to the side. So we're, we're in agreement. We're in agreement with this, right? We all agree in the to with the top right. Okay, do we all agree with the top le uh, bottom left? Okay, now which of the axes are out? Yeah. 
The, the whole x-axis is out, right? The whole thing. So this, this is gone. That's gone, 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 gone. It's gone because that's where y is 0. How about the x-axis? Uh, sorry. How about the y-axis? OK. So in particular, this point is absent, right? That point's absent. So let's draw it. Let's draw it. What would it look like? It would look like, yes, we get all of this. We have a, uh, and then we have an open circle. We get all of this, and we don't get any of that. And then we get all of this. Interesting. <coughs> OK, so how about this set? Is it open or closed or what? Closed. Not open. It's not open. <laughs> it's not open. So why is it not open? Yeah, because if you selected a point that was right there, then you couldn't draw a ball that fell in the set. All the, all the balls around that point right there would fall out, would, would fall partially outside. OK, so this set is neither open nor closed. OK. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> what is that? OK. <clears throat> Definition of a neighborhood. A neighborhood. Uh, so a set uh, Y, which is a subset of X, so which in turn is a subset of Rn. So a set Y, which is sitting inside of X, which is sitting inside of Rn, is called a neighborhood. of x, vector x, which is sitting inside of set x, when there exists a ball of radius epsilon about x, which is sitting inside of y. So let's draw this out, because that's a bit uh, interesting. So x can be anything, open, closed, whatever. So this is set x. This is set x. Uh, and then set y <coughs> is sitting inside of here. And point x is sitting inside of y. So what must be true? You can put a ball around x. <laughs> That's a strange definition. OK. <coughs> Definition. Closure. And boundary. So suppose that we have a set x of Rn. A point little x in x, uh, little x in Rn. So notably, I almost said x, but I need to say are in <coughs> is on the boundary of x <coughs> of 
subset X when for all epsilon positive both of these things are true that the ball of radius epsilon centered at point X intersect set X is not empty and the ball centered at epsilon a ball of radius epsilon centered at point X intersect X's complement how are we going to denote the complement? Little c, little c, okay, is also not empty. Okay, <clears throat> so let's try and uh, understand the meaning of this. What this is saying is that point uh, that that vector x is a point that may may be in set x, it may not be in set x, but when you draw a ball around point x, you can't separate it from the set or its complement. You can't, you can't uh, cause a separation to occur. So for example, for example, so I'll draw again one of these funny sets here. Okay, so let's consider this point right, uh, right here. So that red point I just drew right there, is that part of the boundary of this set X? No, it isn't. It isn't because here's a ball, and consider this ball. Does this ball intersect the set? It doesn't. So in a sense, I've separated with this ball the red point from the set. So it's, a separation has occurred. Okay. How about this point? This one was entirely isolated outside the set by a ball. How about this point? It also is entirely inside the set, inside a ball. So that's not part of the boundary either. Let's consider this one. Too many dots? <laughs> oh, now it looks like a creature. Oh, yeah, I'm like, kind of like a... I could draw something like this and it kind of looks like a raccoon or something. Okay, so how about this point? Is this point on the boundary? Yes. It is. Now let's consider why it's on the boundary. So I'm going to draw this ball a little big, but I think you'll still think it's okay. So that point is on the boundary because, have a look, is there any of this ball that's inside of X? Yeah. Yes. This much is inside of X. So I'll shade it in gray. Is there, is there any part of the ball that falls outside of X? Yes. yes, so I'll shade it in green. Now this ball, if we, take, if we run with that coloring scheme, this one would be all green, and this one would be all gray. Now what I want you to observe about this point in particular is if we color it in that way, there's, you, you must always have some gray color and some green color. You always fall in some inside and some outside, no matter how small you make that ball. Is that, is that red point in the set X? It is, because that's where I drew the solid bit, right? Okay. Now, do you have to be in the set X to be in the boundary of set X? No, you do not. Because, how about this point right here? It's on the dashed bit. Is that, in, is that point in set X? No. It isn't because that, that was on the dashed bit. Now if I, draw, if I draw a ball around it, and if I stick with that coloring scheme, do you observe that some of it must be green? Does the green and gray show up at all on the thing? It'll show up better when I scan it. And then some of it must be inside the set. So there's a point that's not in the set that is nevertheless in the boundary of the set. Okay. Good. Any question about that? So this is denoted. So remark. The set of all points on the boundary of X
is denoted both fortunately and unfortunately with the following symbol. Fancy D X. Is that exactly the same D as the partial D from your previous calculus class? It is the same, one and the same symbol. Okay, but, but I'll forestall any discussion about why the same symbol is being used here. <clears throat> okay, so that's the boundary. Definition of the closure. So if we have x is a subset of Rn, then how does the book denote the closure? With a hat. The closure of x is x union the boundary of x. And this is denoted with a hat. X is a subset. X is a subset of Rn. Okay. So, for example, suppose that we have the following subset of, this is a bit of an abuse, but I think you understand my meaning. Suppose that we have this, this little piece of interval is a subset of the reals. Is a subset of the reals. Uh, what's the boundary? Both endpoints. They're both in the boundary. So this, uh, the boundary in this case, if this is set x, then the boundary of set x is just the two points this point and that point, those two points. <clears throat> then, what's the closure of x? It's, it's, it's all of x, and then we'll add this point, we'll union in this point, but it's already there, so that does nothing. And then we'll union in also this point, and that does affect it, yes? Yes, thank you. Exclosure is this. That's interesting. Okay. <clears throat> what if, what if uh, <clears throat> we have something like this? So one of these sets again. And I'm talking about all of this. So if this is set X, construing it as a subset of R2, then what's the boundary of set X? Yeah, it's, so the reason why I colored it in is because when I want to say the boundary of X, it's just the, this edge right here. That's what, they're supposed to be identical. <clears throat> so the boundary of X does not include anything on the inside. None of that's in there. None of that's in there. And then what is the closure of X? Yeah, it's the shaded version, right? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Finally, one last bit. definition of the interior <clears throat> so the interior given a set X in Rn the interior of X
is in the first place denoted as x, but now it needs a hat, and because this is a different uh, thing, it has a different hat, its hat is a circle, a little open circle there, <coughs> is defined as the set of all x in x, point x in set x, such that there exists an epsilon greater than zero, such that the ball of radius epsilon centered at x is contained in x. So that is to say, it's all the points that are in x that can be surrounded by a ball, and you don't have to leave x to do it. Okay? <clears throat> so for example, if this is the set x, then what is the interior of x? <clears throat> everything but the endpoints, right? Uh, well, everything except that one that we have there. So this point is not in the interior because you can't surround it by a one ball and without leaving the set. So the interior looks like this. <clears throat> so now, what I want to leave you with is the following uh, point of view in, in that we're going to espouse over and over and over again in our class. <clears throat> and that is that we're going to be interested in sets. And we're going to be quite interested in the distinction between points which are interior and points which are not. So this point is interior. This point is interior and in, a, in the mathematician's viewpoint that means that locally, local to that point, it looks, like, it looks like you're on a copy of the reals. Everything that you could do normally in R2, since that's what I drew, you could do near that point. You could move left, you could move right, you could move up and down. Okay. However, this point, this point is a boundary point, and locally, You're allowed to move up and down, and you're allowed to move right, but you're not allowed to move left. You're not going to be allowed to move left. So here on this boundary, your movement is restricted. In my particular drawing, can you see any other point where your movement is even further restricted? In a corner, right? And they will literally be called corners. <laughs> So from that point, if you are to move but not leave the set, you can move down and left, but you can make no movements uh, up or right. Okay, so these are the kinds of worlds that we'll live in. Okay, so have a nice weekend.